गुड मॉर्निंग इसको पिन करो एवरी ईयर वी सेलिब्रेट द इंटरनेशनल म्यूजियम डे ऑन एटीन मे um this year our goal is to advocate the museums uh, for as the key drivers for recovery in the post covid era to reimagine the future of museums uh, and their role in our societies so let's join our hands to promote the cultural exchanges uh, as a catalyst uh, for peace among people more than ever we are uh, organizing today a lecture on future of museums uh, recover and reimagine by dr janavi falke uh, i'll request our director mr kenner sir to please enlighten us more on this uh oh, thank you zuma again once again a formal welcome to all our distinguished guests who have joined us um, in this zoom meeting of course we will also be having this recorded and uh, putting it uh, both on uh, facebook and youtube there's a small little uh, no technical glitch because of that we are not able to go to live on facebook uh, my apologies on this um you know all of us are aware that uh, 18th may uh, is celebrated commemorated all across the world as uh, international museum day uh, since 1977 based on the recommendations of uh, international council of uh, museums um uh, we on behalf of the the national council of science museums are uh, commemorating this event every year and uh, at the nehru science center we have a distinguished speaker uh, dr janvi falke my colleague uh, juma will actually be introducing formally to you um, maybe immediately after my brief introduction i would like to say that uh, unfortunately this is the second year in a row that uh, we are organizing this international museum day online last year also we just about the the, the lockdown had begun and uh, most of the museums remained closed in india and this time again uh, due to the second uh, wave uh, uh, we have, most of the museums are uh, closed but then um, like all the uh, the life species we have also evolved and uh, tried to adapt ourselves to the new um, norm that uh, the covid pandemic has brought us so we are trying to remain connected with our audience on the digital platform bringing in as many lectures as many programs as many events and experiments and uh, in our own um, exhibitions uh, digital exhibition things like that i am not going to go more into that because we are already delayed by about 15 minutes or so i will again once again wishing you all a very happy uh, international museum day and the topic chosen for this year is uh, very pertinent the future of museums uh, recover and reimagine i think this is extremely useful because uh, most of the museums uh, i think about 25 to 30% of the museums perhaps may close that's uh, such is the 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 impact of uh, the covid pandemic on the financial aspect of the museums uh, in india of course uh, several of the museums are government funded and even the private ones are suffering but uh, they are trying to remain afloat with these few words once again i would like to welcome all our distinguished guests uh to this uh, international museum stay uh, webinar uh, and i will hand over the, uh, the um, back to dr zuma asking i mean requesting her to please introduce the speaker zuma back to you thank you sir uh, for this uh, beautiful introduction um uh, today's speaker is uh, dr janavi falke dr janavi falke was appointed as the founding director of science gallery bengaluru Uh, in november 2018 previously uh, she has held a tenured faculty position at kings college in london she started uh, her academic career at the university of heidelberg following which she was based uh, at georgia tech lorraine in france and imperial college in london she was a fellow at the institute of advanced study in berlin she was also an external curator to the science museum london and has been a scholar in residence at the dosh museum in munich uh janavi falke is the author of atomic state big science in 20th century india and she has co-edited science of giants china and india in the 20th century she is also the producer director of the documentary film cyclotron dr falke has read civics and politics at the university of bombay and the school of oriental and african studies in london She has held a doctorate degree uh, in history of science and technology from the Georgia Institute of Technology in Atlanta. She is also holding a position of Sir Ashutosh Mukherjee visiting professor at the National Institute of Advanced Study. 
With these words, I would like to thank our speaker, Dr. Falke, for accepting our proposal for giving this lecture. Now I will uh, pass it uh, over to you, Dr. Falke. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kenneth, and thank you, Juma, for the warm welcome again. And, uh, you know, as I said earlier, uh, we are living at a, at a time where, you know, the, the digital allows us to connect. Something like this would not have been possible even 30 years ago, uh, but it, of course, comes with its own uh, concerns and problems. The machines, machines have a life of their own and a mind of their own. They behave the way they like. So here we are. I'm, I'm delighted to be... Uh, presenting for the Nehru Science Center, uh, an institution I hold close to my heart. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be able to present today. So what I will do is I will divide my presentation into uh, three sort of broad sections. In the first section, I will sort of, you know, draw a brief outline of museum, uh, well, the, the, the world of museums before the pandemic. Uh, what's happening because of the pandemic? What are we therefore recovering from uh, or need to recover from? And the direction of reimagination. So I'm going to um, speak in the reimagined section about Science Gallery Bengaluru and share with you, uh, you know, how we have developed um, in the last uh, about three and a half years that I have been in position and where we hope to go from here. So. You know, many of you will be aware, so please uh, do forgive me if some of this is new for you. For, the, for my colleagues at the Neuroscience Center, uh, what I will say for the first few, three, four minutes will be very, very familiar, but I think it's, it deserves to be repeated because it's not something that is very well known in the public domain. What do I mean by that? What are museums, right? Uh, it's a, it's a, uh, in a, in a sense, a, a very obvious answer, but in some ways, I think Trying to understand what does the museum world look like, especially when we are thinking about science museums, is, is an important uh, thing to understand. So museums in many ways began, you know, as collections, as collections of wealthy people or of rulers, basically kings and princes. And this has been happening through sort of, you know, through uh, what we can call early modern and modern history. So in Europe, it would be the Wunderkammer, the you know, naturalistic erections, etc. So the uh, so museums were integral to the process of learning about the world around us. It was uh, museums were a part of knowledge making of the physical world. So unlike today, when we see museums as spaces which contain not you know objects of history alone and not objects of you know current knowledge making. When they began, museums were places of learning. Museums were places of classifying and therefore understanding the species around us, the world around us. You know, be it uh, be it you know, the zoological collections, botanical collections, um, you know, except rock collections, etc. So, museums are collections based, right? And today they are historical collections based. At some point, they were contemporary collections based. So that is what has changed drastically about the nature of the museum from when they began to now, right? So today, while we collect objects of historical interest for museums, they are not being collected in order to be classified in order to make new knowledge. And what, what does that mean for the museums, but also for knowledge making is something I'll come back to when we come to the reimagined part of, the, uh, of, the, of my talk today. Now, in the 1970s, there's an interesting, uh, there's an interesting turn and an interesting change in the nature of science museums. So up until the early half of the, of the 20th century, basically, it would be safe to assume that museums were collections based. Collections were often grown in labs or in departments or by rich people in order to understand the world around them. And then these grew into public spaces and public institutions somewhere, somewhere around the 19th century in different phases. So uh, uh, the museum was a, and when it became public, the museum was a pedagogical space. So from a space of learning, a space of making knowledge to, to public pedagogy, which is largely the function that museums serve even today. 
looking at the middle decades of the of the 20th century there's an interesting story that in fact connects to bombay and uh, uh so so here's the thing there was a person uh, and this my colleagues at the nehru science center will know about him know a lot about him uh frank oppenheimer who was a physicist a cosmic ray physicist uh who was also the brother of robert uh, j oppenheimer the person who is sort of very well known for his work on the uh, on the manhattan project and therefore in the making of the first atomic weapons after the second world war in the united states um in the early 50s around 1953 between 1953 55 there was something there, there was well it was called the mccarthy era basically when because this was the these were the early years of the cold war people with left leanings people who belonged or people who um sort of you know looked at the soviet union as a good example of uh industrialization of what was primarily an agricultural economy for example or people who believed in in communism and marxism were you know not uh, not seen as um not seen as well how, how should i put it integral to the social fabric in the united states because it was fighting a so called cold war with the soviet union the world was getting divided into two camps so anyone with leftist leanings was a problem uh funnily enough robert oppenheimer himself was left leaning but so was his brother because of his because of uh, robert oppenheimer's work on the manhattan project he was while he was questioned he was brought in for questioning he was spared in a sense his scientific career that was not the case for his brother frank oppenheimer lost his job at princeton as a physicist um, as as i said earlier he he was studying cosmic ray physics and another colleague of his at the university of rochester bernard peters also lost his job for the same reasons in fact in the case of bernard peters he his story is also interesting because he was a prisoner in the dachau concentration camp from where he escaped his wife escaped first she was a student of medicine he escaped after that and they both found themselves in california he was working in an orchard after which at some meeting he met robert oppenheimer i'm talking about bernard peters then became a student of physics and rose you know and became a good sort of a, he was a, he was a fabulous physicist uh, got a job at the university of rochester his wife by then finished her medicine studies and he was in rochester and so bernard peters and frank oppenheimer lost their jobs at the same time what does this have to do with india and what does this have to do with science centers here's the thing when both peters and oppenheimer frank oppenheimer lost their jobs they were both offered jobs at the tata institute of fundamental research in bombay tifr bombay and bernard peters in fact moved to bombay lived there for 10 years uh and worked in cosmic ray physics with homi jangir baba and many other people and then moved on to denmark as the chairperson of the danish atomic energy commission that's bernard peter's story frank oppenheimer was also offered a job at tifr bombay and he accepted the job he you know negotiated his conditions work conditions where will my you know uh, children study where will i live etc so there are letters between the tifr and homi jangir baba and frank oppenheimer in the archive where you know he, the, all of this discussion is available to see and when just as he was about to move to india his passport was impounded and he wrote a very he wrote what looks like you know in hindsight a very sad letter basically a two line letter to homi jangir baba saying he can no longer move to india because he has been denied a passport to travel so this was you know this was the time this was the story that this led to frank oppenheimer moving to a ranch in california and he set up what we all today know or he established what we all today know as the exploratorium and so while tifr missed getting a you know a, a good cosmic ray physicist uh what we got instead was a complete transformation in our understanding of public space for science through the establishment of the exploratorium as many people who work in the space for science centers will know the exploratorium produced starting the early 1970s uh, late 60s early 70s three big black books they are called the cookbooks the exploratorium cookbooks 
every single science center in the world was established using these cookbooks. So what we saw in the middle decades of, well, the middle and later decades of the 20th century was a transformation of the science museum towards a science center. So the, so the preferred public space for science became a more active space, not that did not engage with a historical collection as such, but began to engage with direct pedagogy through sort of, you know, uh, contained experiments in science. It changed the nature of how we did public pedagogy for science thereafter. In India today, we have well over 100 science centers. And, and if you go back into the history of the, of the National Council for Science Museums, you will see how in the early days, the cookbooks played a major, major role. Of course, we've moved away from those now. And there are more experiments coming from elsewhere in the world as well. But the nature of that institution is inspired by the work done by Frank Oppenheimer in the Exploratorium. We, there's another uh, aspect that I would like to note here, which is that in India, we also, and this is something I have at least personally not observed in many other places, but maybe Mr. Kenneth can correct me because he has seen more science centers than I have, uh, which is that in India, we have a, have a very specific format, not in every science center, but at least three that I, four that I have noticed. Uh, one is the Pilani Museum. The second is uh, the Birla Museum. The third is the Nehru Science Center in Bombay. And the fourth is the Vishweshwaraya Museum in Bangalore. These four spaces are hybrids because these spaces actually have historical collections, but they also have the science center like mandate of pedagogy. So in that sense, these spaces fall between these two ideals of what public spaces for science look like, right? Uh, I mean, one of my one of my favorite uh, things in the collection in Bombay is the Ural computer, uh, which came from the Soviet Union. And, uh, you know, there, there are, a, to the best of my knowledge, only two in the world. And so it's a very, very precious object, um, which came to India to the Indian Statistical Institute and then was later donated uh, to uh, the Nehru Science Center. I'm not entirely sure of the provenance, uh, but you know, I'm, I'm, the next time I visit, now that I've grown up and I, I sort of uh, you know, do history of science, I think it will be an interesting project uh, to explore. So, so far, so, so far about you know, the, the, the sort of beginnings of museums in collections for study, them becoming a part of museums, which became public spaces for pedagogy and insight into you know, how, how we studied the world. And from there, to uh, a, a firm movement in the later half of the 20th century to science centers, which, which may not, in fact, most of them do not have historical collections at all. They are primarily places with experiments, with contained experiments for understanding of science, science communication, public understanding of scientific principles, scientific ideas. So what is, what I'd like you to bear in mind, the thought I'd like you to bear in mind as we move forward is that we have in many ways uh, with the contained experiments, what happens is that while we prioritize the understanding of scientific principles or so, so, uh, what, I, what, what I mean by scientific principles, the scientific principles in the making of scientific knowledge, rarely do we get an insight into how that knowledge is actually made or arrived at. There might be some small text given there, but there is no way for a person coming in who can actually, in a way, open up the process of how that knowledge was made in ways in which was possible to do with the very early collections. Why is that important? Is that important at all? Is something I'll come back to when we talk about the reimagined section. So here we are today, a year, a little over a year into a pandemic. We are talking about the need to recover from this. So my, I want to explore two questions. One is what is it that we've lost? And therefore what, and the, and therefore what is it that we want to recover? Or at least what is, the, what, what is it that we're told we need to recover? Why do I ask that question? If I was sitting in London or Berlin, I wouldn't ask this question in quite the same way. And here's the reason why. Because in India, we are not a very strong museum-going culture. While we have 
museums and and you know museum like spaces like the prince of wales museum in bombay and and uh, uh, the bhavdaji lard museum in bombay the nehru science center with this museum like collection but also the science center and planetarium and again because numbers are very large in our country these places are crowded that having said it's not an activity that we encourage every you know like if you go to if you in many european and um european countries and in america uh, increasingly also in china that's the thing to do over the weekend where you pack up you go and you spend the day in the museum learning more not only about your past be it scientific past or historical past i mean not that they are separate or you know uh, go to a science center and and learn some more things uh not only were we sort of a you know not a very museum going culture generally but that has gone down even more i would argue and again i would you know love to hear insights from mr kenny and his colleagues later uh it is also changing because of um uh the internet because many things are now available on the internet to people um and you know many people including museums are programming digitally the numbers of people actually walking into museums in india especially but also elsewhere is on is not on the rise so to speak, you know if if i may say so and in this context when we have a pandemic what is it that has what is it that has gone wrong what has gone wrong is that museums that rely on tickets and um uh, for tickets and and the attendance of people and the sponsorship of events for survival um have basically lost their sources of income so worldwide small museums many small museums have actually closed down without any certainty of them being able to open uh or you know uh, when then the pandemic is finally over whenever that is uh because they would they many of them are simply now not even able to afford the rents for the buildings that they occupy so of course the kind of questions that are being asked are you know in the digital age do we even need large spaces dedicated to museums can everything not be moved online can everything not be 3d scanned and you know put up online etc these are the questions that are being asked again i'll come back to come back to what moving to the digital means and what it's uh, you know what what its consequences are when we discuss the uh, reimagined part of it so in many ways what we are what we are expecting to recover from is the absence of the public in public spaces and therefore their visits to museums but also for the for the return of revenue streams to museums that actually rely on these revenue streams uh as mr kenneth mentioned at the start uh in india at least most science centers are uh, state funded state sponsored so them being closed down is less of a possibility because they've always relied on state funding um now this is something you know um when i speak to colleagues here in in bangalore uh, and especially you know from the it world the first question they ask is so what's your revenue model how are you going to become self sustaining and may, and at some point when i get you know when it becomes difficult to to argue for this i i talk to them about the smithsonian institution which is in fact so sort of you know the world's flagship museum complex with several museums research centers um you know uh, uh available for the general public 73% of its um funding is federal 73% of its fund of its funding comes from the government a little more comes from re from revenue from ticketing from cafes from museum shops etc and then the rest of it comes from philanthropy and this in a country i mean the united states is known for its philanthropy not only in its own on its own soil but also globally and so you have people who are able to and are willing to put millions and millions of dollars into cultural institutions into public institutions this so in a country where that is possible you still have about 73 to 75% of the funding for the smithsonian institution coming from the government what i want to say with this is that museums are not profit making institutions museums cannot make profits because if that is what is driving then in many ways the primary function of 
a museum, which, you know, and, and many, many of these, many museums, but also the idea of science centers, you know, have deep connections to academia and therefore to pedagogy. The desire in public spaces for science and also for history more generally, so other kinds of museums, is to bring more information, more knowledge, more awareness to the public. It is, a, it is an intangible good. It is, a, it is an intangible cultural good. It is an intangible cultural enterprise, which is going to be very difficult to, um, to, in a way, market in quite the same ways. Because what will people pay for? So often I have colleagues who will, you know, who, who will raise the question, you know, people pay money to go see a film and, you know, they will pay an expensive ticket to go into a mall in a, in a theater and, and, you know, go and see a, see a film. So why wouldn't they pay the same amount for a museum, uh, you know, for a museum ticket? And some might, and some might not. But what we can't forget is that not everybody is able to go and pay for pay that kind of a ticket to watch a film in a mall. And pedagogy is not the equivalent of entertainment. So it, it is not hurting society if, you know, 50% of your population doesn't have access to entertainment of that, or at that scale of that kind, at that expense. But it matters to the quality of your future generations if 50% of your population is not able to afford or not able to access knowledge and information that is essential to have better educated, better informed future generations. And so the equivalence is actually a very difficult one. I think, so I, I, I personally find the British model actually appealing. Uh, mind you, Germany and the US do still charge museum tickets and fairly high. Uh, costing museum tickets, but I find the model in the UK actually very, very good. So it's 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 the reverse of what the Europeans follow. In most most European countries, do not charge tuition fees in universities, and so education is free, and they charge museum fees, uh, which are you know, not necessarily very high, but pretty pretty pretty. I mean, not not inexpensive either. It's not like two euros. It's like fifteen to twenty five euros. In the UK, you have extremely high, extremely expensive university education, but museums are free. And uh, what they do, though, in UK museums is that they have boxes, collection boxes. So if you're able to afford and if you wish to give, you can actually drop some uh, uh, cash into their boxes. So again, you know, this is not to go into the details of how museums do generate revenue or not, but, the, but to discuss a more fundamental point in terms of why would museums have to close down at this difficult point of time uh, for lack of revenue? Because in, in many ways, I think museums that were founded on the, on the principle of being able to survive on revenue streams that were not grants um, is, is, is a difficult proposition to sustain over time. So recovering from this uh, will require uh, you know, a rethinking of where do museums and uh, places like museums belong in our thinking of how we inform, how we, how we, um, how we nurture future generations, right? Like, so where do they belong and therefore how do we fund them and how do we ensure their security such that they become yet another arm in our ability to train future generations, you know, um, better in, able to, in order to be able to uh, tackle future problems. And how, uh, you know, a country that trains only a minor section of its population to be ready for the future is not going to have much of a future because if the bulk of your population has no access to modern thinking, to modern ideas, to understand where, you know, where we came, where in a sense we came from, thinking in terms of history of science, but also history otherwise, and therefore, where we are and where we are going is a perspective that allows people to ground themselves, their identities, their learning. And if they are denied this, uh, it is it is going to be it is going to be difficult. Uh, and this is something we you know we've seen this in history. I'm happy to kind of talk about it a little uh, little more. So I have three messages in terms of how do we reimagine, and uh, I'll quickly move over to, uh, you know, presenting a little bit about the gallery in terms of how we are trying to do that with Science Gallery Bengaluru. 
but i think the three three messages that i have in terms of reimagination of the museum space for the future be they museums museums be they gallery like spaces or be they hybrid institutions like the nehru science center and its and its other colleagues that i uh, siblings that i spoke about the three ways forward i think are one uh deep uh, integration of the digital this is the most obvious answer everybody knows this I, there is no rocket science to this and there's nothing new about what i'm saying how we are trying to do this is something i will uh, you know go into in a in a in a second the the second thing is the sec my second message is collaboration so i i i do believe very strongly not only for financial reasons but also for other reasons um museums should work not only with each other but also with other institutions of learning like universities and i'm not talking about universities and schools and and i'm not talking about looking at university students and school students as audiences i'm talking about collaborating with university professors researchers and young undergraduate students in order to further the development of content in museum spaces right so i'm talking about collaboration in that sense i'm talking about collaboration with spaces of learning in order to further the development of better content going forward better and more relevant content going forward getting young people engaged in content development is going to be extreme uh, researchers and young people in in development of content is going to be extremely relevant and important going forward how and why i'll again come back to it and, uh, uh, and i'm happy to i'm happy to take questions on that and the final message i have for the reimagination of these spaces is that of engagement so i think we will have to see a move further from pedagogy to engagement so moving away from in the case of science museums trying to explain first principles of science to actually creating a program of engagement which is where the content of science is of course there but it's more about what is what is a truth claim what is the scientific method why should we bother about it what are good questions to ask what does research even mean so the cluster of thinking the cluster of ideas around knowledge making that so we need to engage the public at large in that kind of work rather than trying to simply sort of you know here let's do this experiment by doing this you'll understand what gravity is i think what we need to do is if we take the example of gravity move from explaining gravity so i'm not saying one shouldn't explain gravity but move from there to encompass in a much larger way why gravity matters to you what is gravity in your life i think th that movement so uh, an engagement where you don't invite participation because participation is still on the terms of the museum itself to change your terms to not invite participation but to reach out and to see where the relevance of what we hold actually lies in the lives of the public at large so those are my three messages for today which is a reimagination of public spaces for science in museums included asks for better engagement with the digital because the digital allows us to bring in not only new audiences but also new experts irrespective of where they are from it's also a format that goes away with your viewer and your audience with them and therefore they can do something with it beyond your own walls so it takes the museum beyond its walls something that is very obvious to anyone who works in the museum sector to collaboration collaboration for content generation not merely for audience development and the third engagement where the concerns the ideas and the relevance of our content for the public at large becomes the starting point and not the end point of what we've developed with that i'll just briefly introduce you to science gallery bengaluru and tell you a little bit more about us so we are a part of an international network of galleries we are nine of us across the world uh we have two uh, in uh, uh america uh, one in australia and then five in europe and one in india we are the only asian gallery and we will remain the only indian gallery going forward so in many ways we have a sort of national um 
outlook. Now, all of the other galleries that we have are on based on university campuses. So they are owned by universities. In India, we went with a different model, and here's the reason why. In at King's College London, where I was before this, uh, there is also a science gallery. At King's in London, you can study medicine, you can study law, you can study engineering, you can study film, you can study history, um, what have you. You can study physics, of course. In India, we have the Indian Institute of Science, School of Planning and Architecture, National Institute of Design, Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. Our higher education is entirely conducted in silos. We have very few universities which, which are not siloed, but even there, it's impossible. So like if you look at the central universities, it's impossible to study on the same campus. Everything from law to medicine, to history of art, to fine art, to industrial art, to product design, to whatever be it. So that was the one. Re that was one of the main reasons why it was difficult to host a science gallery on a single campus. The second reason was that the, uh, you know, budgets, budgets for running a public space are very high, as Mr. Kenneth and his colleagues can testify for. You know what it takes to keep a Nehru Science Center running. So what we have in Bangalore is an independent and autonomous institution fo founded. By, uh, by the government of Karnataka. So they've given us our land, our first capital, and uh, a third of our operating costs going forward. We also have academic partners, three academic partners, where uh, the Indian Institute of Science is our lead academic partner, and the National Center for Biological Sciences and Shristi Institute of Art, Design, and Technology are our collaborating partners. We also work quite closely with other institutions in Bangalore and elsewhere. So what is it that we are trying to do at Science Gallery Bangalore. We're trying to bridge the distance between science and culture, and the format that we take for it is one of experiment. I will come back to that also in, uh, in a second. So here's the sort of, you know, the quick overview, institutional overview for us. We, the vision is to bring science back into culture. We work very closely with young adults. So because we are university linked, university based, we work with the age group of 15 to 28, which is also slightly different from many museums where the target age is actually younger. And uh, the the uh, I mean, and, and again, you know, one can argue that people learn much younger. But so, but this is not about establishing that somehow people learn better in this age group. It's that in the, at this age group, there are there is nothing by way of a cultural institution where the creativity of young adults can be nurtured. As a result of which, these are our target. Um, uh, target population or target age group. So our messaging is strongest for this age group. It doesn't mean others cannot come and see our exhibitions. Uh, what we are trying to say is that our work is mainly for grown-ups. Uh, reimagine research and shape culture. What do we mean by reimagine research? So this is the this is the way that our work is more or less divided. We have a public engagement complex where we have uh, our building is under construction where we have uh, exhibition halls, reading rooms, um, open studio, et cetera. But we also have a public lab complex. Now, this is an interesting part. And th this is what I'd like you to bear in mind when I, when I talk about reimagination and engagement. My favorite story for you for this is an Indian one. There have been public spaces or public, sorry, not public spaces, public laboratories in the past. We haven't had many in the 20th century. In fact, that did not, um, become the dominant form, the science centers became the dominant form. Uh, and so in the reimagination, when I talk about engagement, this is what I'm talking about, the public lab complex. So the Indian Association for Cultivation of Science in Calcutta, when it started out in the late 19th century and early 20th century, it was the kind of place where C.V. Raman or Chandrasekhar Venkata Raman, the only Indian science laureate who was born, raised, worked, and died here, uh, you know, he was an accountant by day and a physicist by evening. And he used the Indian Association for Cultivation of Science Laboratories where he carried out his work in acoustics, which established him as a world-renowned physicist. There is no such opportunity for anybody in India today. If you're not registered as a science student or if you're not working in a science institution, you have no access to labs. You have no access to do any serious work in science 
or any exploratory work in science if you're not in the, in a sense, if you're not in the ranks. So as a member of, as an interested, serious member of the public, there is no room to dis, do this kind of work. So when we reimagine public spaces for science, it is this that I would like us to prioritize. This is our building, which is under construction. Hopefully in a year and a half, when you come to Bangalore, we'll be able to show you our programming. We have uh, conducted four exhibitions so far. We started programming in October 2019. And you know, in less than whatever, in less than six months, basically the pandemic broke out. So, you know, the bulk of our existence has been under the pandemic. Uh, the first two exhibitions, which is Elements and Submerge, happened uh, before the pandemic, and the other two happened after the pandemic opened. So, needless to say, the first two exhibitions were physical and the next two were digital. Uh, we have what we do is even after the exhibition, we maintain a strong archive of our exhibits online. So even if you go now and look up on our website, you will find all the program recordings are available to view so that the programming remains, remains accessible and uh, you know, can, be, can be mobilized by anyone, you know, at any point, right? Like, so it's not like we make an exhibition, even if it's a physical one, it's done and it's over and you see nothing of it after. Digital recording or documentation has helped us to keep this work such that, so for example, during Submerge, we had a public lecture series on water where everyone from, you know, a cultural historian, a hydro, uh, uh, hydrologist, fluid dynamicist, chemist, physicist, ecologist, historian, sociologist, they all spoke about water. All of these lectures are now available for anyone to hear. And because, you know, we were able to record them and make them available on our archive. For, the, for Phytopia and Contagion, uh, they are entire, they are born digital, so to speak, right? Like, so, so the entire material is available again for you to see. Contagion is ongoing. It closes on the 13th of June. I strongly encourage all of you to come have a look. The best way to see our exhibition is to join a mediated session. So, um, you know, where you enter and, and there is someone to actually take you through the exhibition. And then of course, you after that, you can experience it on your own. So I, strong, I, I strongly encourage you to, to do that. I'll put up the links in the chat box afterwards. Um, so um, this, yeah, so, 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 you know, the digital, in a way, we are going to keep that element even after we return to physical exhibitions because it is what will allow us to maintain a record of what we've done, but also for all the material and the research that has gone into making that exhibition to be available later for anyone who is interested. We work in, I spoke about collaboration. We work in partnership with several people. So we, we work with uh, the Royal Society for Chemistry uh, when we did the uh, elements exhibition. When for the water submerged exhibition, we worked with the Smithsonian Institution for Phytopia, which was about the world of plants. We worked with the John Innes Center for Plant Sciences, uh, which is a research institution and the Natural History Museum in London. For Contagion, we are working with the Robert Koch Institute in Berlin and Edward Jenner's house, uh, which is a museum in uh, the UK. Um, you know, as everyone uh, possibly you know, remembers, Edward Jenner developed the first vaccine for uh, smallpox. So this is what our building will look like when it's ready. And thank you for listening to me. And I am ready for questions if you have any. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Janvi. Um, uh, it's interesting that you really talked about uh, the hybrid model and you know yeah. um, Frank Oppenheimer's uh, connection with uh, the city of Mumbai. Yes. Uh, you'd be pleasantly surprised, or maybe you're aware of that. Uh, we were a part of the CSIR moment when huh. it all began. Yes. Both uh, the first two museums, for example, the one in uh, Birla Museum in Calcutta and the one in uh, Bangalore. We were yeah. a part of uh, CSIR. Yeah. Subsequently, what happened is even when we got the plot of land where we are now presently located, again, that was to be in line with uh, what's there in the Birla Museum or for that matter, the Vishweshwaraya Museum which came as a tribute hmm. for uh, Sir M. Vishweshwaraya. Uh, it was hmm. incidentally to be called the Mafatlal Science and Technology Museum in Mumbai. Then, okay. then you know, the, the um, Frank Oppenheimer incident happened. Huh. You know, he was to come to Mumbai in TFR, things did not happen. That was the time when, uh, you know, the uh, 
there's some kind of a because the land was allotted uh, quite early uh, to yeah. the nehru science center but nothing was coming up yeah that's when the our own uh, the founders dr saroj ghosh and others they realized yeah. that why don't we go the the uh, exploratorium way yeah that just about started that the, yeah that is the reason you will find that what actually frank hoppenheimer did inside the experimentation yeah. kind of a thing the yeah. in fact the nehru science center is the first one to start a open uh, air uh, um, what we call as a fun science or a science park exhibit science park is yes. not there anywhere so yeah. the what happened inside frank hoppenheimer's uh, Uh, exploratorium happened outside here okay. by then we had already collected some of the uh, artifacts antiquities hmm. that's why you you find a um, hybrid here in mumbai where you yeah. have some antiquities we also have the uh, the hands on type of a exploratorium model here yeah uh, incidentally there is another uh, um, uh, uh, gentleman here i mean in fact uh, uh, dr b v srikantan who was from mysore Yes, Karnataka. He yes. was a director of uh, uh, the TI for for a very long time. He himself was a cosmic ray physicist. Yes, you know the. I mean, there is again a connection between the Nehru Science Center and Frank Hoppenheimer, both from the point of view of genesis of the hands-on type of experiment, but also yeah. uh, uh, the uh, the cosmic ray physicist being the chairman of the Nehru Science Center Executive Committee for almost two terms, even yes. when it was inaugurated. Yes. <laughs> so this is for my colleagues who are there in this uh, in the group. because not many are aware of the history of uh, the science center and you know the genesis of uh, oppenheimer coming into this yes uh, this is so any of you if you have some questions you can please do ask questions sir uh, may i ask one question yeah umesh please umesh is my colleague uh, yeah umesh please yeah uh, thank you for wonderful in fact uh, uh, even connecting with ncsm and it was good to know that uh, you are from mumbai itself <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> so and it was really a uh, very interesting um, lecture Uh, you Actually. mentioned something about uh, public lab com complex in your yeah. uh, what is this all about means whether people are allowed to come uh, means uh, without any prior registration or just walk in type of and they can do some experiments or some do something like what is this all about i think that was very good uh, something very exciting yeah, yeah. so you know it's um so no i mean you know because that would become a demo place right like you can't just come and do an experiment i mean for to do to to do any so you know the example i used was of cv raman and iacs right mm, yeah. so if you want to do anything proper if you're a member of the if, if you're generally sort of not in an institution not you know whatever but if you if you have a serious interest and if you want to do it any experiment requires the development of a design uh, you know some background etc etc so what we are going to do with this public lab complex is that we're going to have fellows and but but we don't we are not going to you know it's not going to be like okay please like you know you want to do a project like you know otherwise the, i'm i'm fairly certain we'll get lots of you know mtech and phd students who will want to do the experiments using our labs no that's not the point the point is that we want to see proposals that come from across disciplines right so no we are, we are not going to encourage proposals that use just one lab but we want people to use more than one lab so we have five labs and they, the project will have to address more than more than one lab at least right so it will have to be collaborative in, and interdisciplinary in that sense or interdisciplinary in that sense and the other condition we have is that the person takes an apprentice so a young person who will be working with the with the fellow in order to get socialized into thinking beyond disciplines now how does one make this kind of a thing approachable relatable and uh, accessible to the public at large we will have you know late lab events etc those kinds of things where we have we can workshops on you know simple things like how how uh, how microscopes work or you know how do you think about this how do you think about that etc and then hopefully through our programming develop you know allow people to develop a sensibility where they can then propose their own experiments right so the experiments will have to be proposed formally they will be evaluated formally okay so it's not uh, because otherwise it will be just a demo Mm -hmm. you know because anyone walking in doing anything i mean a one of course public safety concerns because not everyone is you know in a way trained to do that but what we so what we are saying is not that you come and do whatever you want but if you want to be trained to do something come you don't have to have an experiment in mind you don't have to have anything in mind say you are a historian you you want to know how a uh, life sciences you know laboratory looks like and you know what happens in such a laboratory come come and you know come spend uh, you know weekends learn about it talk to people find out more you might do something you might not you know 
doesn't matter yeah so that's the so that's the approach we are taking so what what we want happening there should be serious serious beyond discipline so not the same work that's been done in universities the universities do it quite well and the institutes do it quite well they don't need a public space to do that kind of work this is the space to encourage new kind of work maybe i think with the new education policy where you are having this uh, inter interdisciplinary or if that uh, may work even better i think yeah yeah i mean interdisciplinary is an idea that you know i mean 20th like late 20th century onwards you know in fact if you look at anything you know uh, that's happening around us it's interdisciplinary now right like there's a there's a fabulous story about uh, that came out in the wired uh, not not the wired but the wired which is the tech magazine about uh, how uh, you know there was no consensus uh, or no consensus no the who and cdc for the longest time rejected the idea that covid 19 uh, or sars covid is uh, airborne airborne yeah. right and now very quietly they have accepted it and we the wired carries a story about it i'll put it in the chat box right now um, i'll find it and put it in the chat box basically it took a historian a graduate student in his of history of medicine who did the research who now has a paper in the british journal journal of medicine to show that there was a mistake made there's a mistake made at some point in conflating various categories to basically say that anything under 5 5 uh, microns was was an uh, was an aerosol and anything above that was a droplet and that was those were observations of tuberculosis those were not generic observations after which even whenever in after which two things happened one is the founder langmuir of cdc founding director who had some sort of a an easy relationship to airborne to the claim to air, uh, airborne uh, disease being airborne because of its connection to the old theory of miasma right which was sort of considered sort of not very scientific etc and so he had a troubled relationship to that as a result of which basically uh, you know this kind of got sidelined the the research that conducted at that point of time got sidelined and uh, the number of five the, the number five microns was thrown at everybody starting the 1950s and 60s without much verification and whenever anyone claimed otherwise including a scientist uh, uh, from hong kong an engineer in fact from hong kong uh, uh, basically that the, you know the, the argument was aerosols and air is understood best by uh, physicists and engineers and pathogens are best understood by medical people right with no conversation across the two and it, in the end it for me it's a it's a it's a lovely vindicative moment it took a historian to show them that they made a huge mistake <laughs> and so now without much hue and cry and without a press conference who and cdc <laughs> have both accepted that this is an airborne disease because their calculations and that they have conflated categories and they were working on wrong assumptions so you know so so the the things that need to happen is we need to take a historian's voice seriously we need to take an account of, basically we should 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 not assume that somebody's background is either an enabler or a disabler of their ability to ask good questions or produce good knowledge so that's the idea that should drive this public lab complex is our sort of you know at least our desire now whether that happens or not we'll of course find out thank you in fact you rightly pointed out you know working in silos bertrand i mean no why just in india in fact uh, bertrand russell talked ah. about uh, you know working in the two islands kind of a thing you know between the art and uh, science uh, uh, creative people so yeah. that exists and in india of course in the academic circle it's more uh, predominant here i think there's one question in the chat box uh, suchita patel i think i'd like to know how do you connect uh, with the history and display will be um, ah, history so and display will be explored Yeah, 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 yeah. So no, good no, question. Yeah. Very good question because I should have mentioned right at the start. We are a non-collections based uh, institution. We don't have a collection, so we don't have any of those problems that Mr. Kenneth has about conservation and taking care of the Ural, you know, because it should not get destroyed, etc. So we are non-collections based. We do not collect anything, and uh, uh, therefore, you know, in a sense, we are free to do our exhibitions the way we want. we don't uh, we don't even collect what we make we give it away so uh, what we do essentially is we have we have only what museums would call temporary exhibitions that's all we have and we change every 3 to 4 months and we have uh, each of our exhibition usually so when our building is ready they will last about 100 days each 
right now we are running them for about 45 days because you know we are not running them in our own space which means uh, and also we are testing we are learning what our audiences want what our audiences learn so our exhibition start out this way we have an open call a global open call and this is true of all the nine galleries and then we get responses um we don't do the same exhibitions at the same time we do we do our own exhibitions so we are all autonomous in that sense uh when we get returns to the open call we have a curatorial committee and an academic advisory committee so it's not single curator driven but it's uh, in that sense very much like uh, most science centers in india work groups of people groups of academics groups of curators um and we work together we select what's missing we bring it together and then that's how we sort of you know Uh, assemble the exhibition we have integrated historical objects so for example in submerge we did have the data logger for india's first monsoon experiments and a, a turning table from uh, for ocean tide current study uh, from the indian institute of science it's an old piece of equipment but it's a working piece of equipment so we got that so one was working but the data logger was of course like half dead um so we did we did sort of uh, uh, integrate historical objects into the story but we did not uh, we do not uh, uh, in a sense prioritize historical objects or deprioritize them where relevant we bring them in because you know what is the what is an exhibition on water without the story of the indian monsoons so you know so this was a this was a good way to show the science story like you know a, a, a create a story about the science of the monsoon uh, so that became a starting point for that conversation then we had a few lectures and you know uh etc we had live experiments also so our exhibitions are in that sense very uh, uh different to a museum uh, exhibition because we have things that grow things that die things that change live experiments uh things that you have to do yourself so they are more uh, uh experimental in that sense and they change so if you come on day 1 and you come on day 3 and you come on day 45 you'll see different things you'll see the same experiment in different forms um we for example yeah i mean that's that's the kind of nature of the experiments yeah so uh, any other questions uh, i am not seeing anything unfortunately we were uh, having the technical issue otherwise um, we find a lot of questions on uh, the social media particularly the, the facebook and youtube yeah. but i think due to some uh, technical issue we'll find out why any other uh, questions from uh any umesh or anybody there are quite a lot of outsiders some I mean, any one of you have question please raise your hand okay i think okay on behalf of uh, the nehru science center and all the wonderful audience uh, i think we had about 98 people on board um i would like to thank you for uh, sparing your time it was fascinating and i'm sure my colleagues uh, will be in touch with you maybe we'll have uh, more of a collaboration between the two of us not necessarily only nehru science center i'm talking about when i say two the national council of science museum which is yes. about Absolutely. 25 science centers and maybe indirectly another 50 people where we have touched i mean we have developed a lot of these science centers thank you so much again Thank you very much. Thank you Thank very you much for inviting you. me, Mr. Kenneth and Umesh. Pleasure to meet you. I look forward to future conversations. Me too. Yeah. Uh, Thank yes, you to sure. the audience also for yeah. being Thank here you. for listening. Thank you, Zuma, and uh, thank you, Rajesh. I know you had some problems, but uh, I mean it's part of the game. Okay. Thank yes, you so much. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs>